In tonight's episode, I've compiled some of the most mysterious, disturbing, and terrifying cases of things in the national parks, from missing persons to paranormal phenomena and eyewitness accounts. This is two hours of high strangeness within our own national parks. Enjoy. Trenton's story is a bit disturbing. Back when Trenton was a teenager, his house backed onto a quiet private section that nearly bordered the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. He thinks technically they actually lived within the park's boundaries, but don't quote him on that one. One day, when he was a teenager, him and his brother went off on an adventure in the woods. They were armed with a few BB guns and some snacks. They didn't go too far into the woods, maybe about a mile or so at most, and it took them a while to get in there because they didn't have the proper hiking boots and the brush was really thick and it was really hot and humid. So they just had some old tennis shoes and jeans on and tank tops. The terrain was pretty rough, Trenton describes, and they had to climb over fallen trees and crawl under others. And it was a pretty fun adventure for the time being. And they remembered that they were walking along this creek bed when they came to a small clearing. Sweaty, exhausted, and thirsty, they decided that they would use this opportunity to rest. And in fact, in the center of this very clearing was a large rock that seemed to jut out of the ground, maybe by about four or so feet high. This was the perfect spot to sit, eat lunch, drink water, and kind of refuel for the next part of the day and adventure. So while they're sitting there eating, Trenton's brother and them both notice this strange mechanical humming sound. In fact, Trenton tells me that it reminded him at the time of somebody running a shop vac, except they're in the middle of the deep woods, not a soul around, but it sounded like it was coming from all around them and not in one specific direction far off. Trenton remembers his brother also being very confused by this and assuring him that he too was hearing it. And so they're looking around in confusion at the source of this noise, but could not find it. And as they're looking around, Trenton notices this knot in his stomach beginning to form. And suddenly he loses his appetite and this overwhelming feeling of dread just kind of creeps over him like a tidal wave about to crash down on a surfer. It was at this point, Trenton admits that he was kind of lost in his own discomfort for a moment, feeling unwell as if a flu or fever had come over him very strange and so sudden like nothing he'd ever experienced before. And right then, both him and his brother heard what sounded like an explosion. But once again, it sounded omnipresent like it was coming from everywhere at once and not in one particular direction or spot. He said it reminded him of a sci-fi sound effect of an explosion. And he also referenced the show Stargate SG-1 from the Sci-Fi Channel and that it reminded him of a sound effect or sound bite that would be used on that specific show because it sounded so weird and not like a typical explosion. And as he began looking around with his brother for the source of this strange explosion, he notices his brother is now nervously glancing over his shoulder. And so he asks him what's wrong and his brother says he thought he saw movement in his bushes to the right, that he didn't want, assuming it was a cougar, to sneak up on them. And so now both boys are listening for a while. And as they're listening intently for movement, they notice that the humming had completely ceased. All other forms of noise had completely died. Whereas before the forest was alive with noise and birds chirping and just the noise that comes with being in a forest during the daytime, all they could feel in here was the wind. And that's when they saw something moving in the bushes directly behind them now and no longer to the right. It was roughly about 15 feet away. Both boys turned to see what it was, and all they could see is these two very bright red eyes staring back at them. They seemed to almost glow for a moment. And when they looked back, the eyes were then gone. Instantly creeped out and done with the day's adventure, they quickly packed up their lunch and started in the direction to head back home. Now, about 10 or so minutes into the walk, or should we say mild jog, both boys had heard something coming up from behind them very quickly. They turned around and saw what they would describe as a dark figure. They thought it was a person, but it was all black, moving, not walking, but moving through the woods towards them very quickly. It was still too far away to make out any specific details, but it was clearly walking on two legs toward them. And the motion was wrong, like it glided through the trees and brush without making a single noise. Whereas they're stepping on stuff and making crunching noises, and they're pretty scared by this point. So now their semi-jog turns into a full-on sprint back towards home. And they looked back a few times and saw that whatever it was was gaining on them getting closer. 
and it seemed to be gliding through the trees and the brush with ease. They don't know how, but it was keeping up with them and getting closer the more they looked back. Once they made it back to their house, they ran through the yard, run inside, lock the door, and they didn't want to tell their parents because they thought that their parents would beat them for making up ridiculous stories. Both boys look out the back window and they could see this form of a dark figure almost kind of swaying standing in the wood line. And it was just standing there swaying, looking in the direction of the house. And they watched it for a while, but it never moved beyond that or ever made a single noise. And after a while, both boys could not sit anymore. It had just evaporated into the air. It's safe to say that after that, they never went into those woods again. Back on March 17th, 2012, a Derek Luking happened to mysteriously vanish in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park without a trace. What's interesting about Derek's case is he actually had a note that was left on his car that simply read, don't try to follow me. This already led many people to believe that this was possibly a suicide trip where he would probably just go off into the woods and maybe fall off a cliff or whatever he had planned. But that did not stop search and rescue personnel and family and friends from looking for Derek. Park rangers and search personnel already realized that trying to find Derek would prove incredibly difficult. And at this point in time, it had already been several days since anybody had even heard from Derek. Derek, about 24 or so years of age at the time of his disappearance, had worked as an orderly at the Peninsula Behavioral Health Center located in Tennessee. But what's odd about Derek's disappearance that alludes to more of a potential suicide case is that he had just stopped showing up to work one day. And this went on for several days. And when his family had found out, like any family, they grew very concerned. And that's when they tried reaching out to him, but he would not answer their calls, nor would he return their phone calls. The family speculate that all of this coincides with the disappearance and probably death of his grandfather, whom he was very close with. And it just so happens that Derek's disappearance also matches the anniversary of his grandfather's death, leading many close friends and family to speculate and theorize that this was probably a case of him opting out due to him not being able to handle the loss of his grandfather, which is very common among many people. The family at one point or another discovered that Derek was actually staying at a hotel in North Carolina. And once they tried to seek him out and arrived at the hotel, he had already been long gone. As his family was making their way back to Tennessee, they actually happened upon his parked car on Newfound Gap Road and immediately began calling it in. The area in which he was parked is right where the Appalachian Trail crosses the Newfound Gap Road, which would lead many to believe that he just up, got out of his car, and went on the trail to opt himself out, probably. Once law enforcement and other investigators began to search his vehicle, they had found the note that said, don't try and follow me, which again, supports the original theory. However, many Great Smoky Mountain National Park officials expressed several doubts about whether the note was actually Derek's or not. After looking inside of Derek's car, they found his wallet full of credit cards, his ID, as well as several supplies like sleeping bags and tents, and even a map of the park which marks everything. What's even more bizarre is all of these things that he had with him, he had just recently purchased, which would allude to him going to use these things for potentially hiking or going on a trip. So it doesn't make sense that he would go and buy these things and yet go off and opt himself out. So while it is a popular theory, maybe there's truly something else going on. And at this point, questions began arising left and right. Had he simply walked into the woods without any gear to help him in the late winter time? And if so, why had he done that? Or was there possibly another reason behind it? Another reason that could have been more sinister and unexplainable. Perhaps he was lured. Perhaps he had fled his car in fear or even at gunpoint. We will never know. As a matter of fact, this story had gained so much attention from national media that one of Derek's friends had actually gone on to talk to CNN and informed them that Derek was a huge fan of the Bear Grylls TV show, Man vs. Wild. And because of that, he could have easily set off in search of an adventure to try and prove to everyone he could do it and clear his mind and try and get some peace from the wild. And even his friend had said that Derek was not a newbie to the wilderness. He had all the equipment and supplies and knowledge he would need to survive a trek out in the woods. So this only made his case much more perplexing. Now, park rangers were not so sure that the gear he had would have been 
fit for the trek he was trying to do, if he was trying to do a trek at all. And as a matter of fact, many of the park rangers working on Derek's case were not at all convinced that the equipment Derek had supposedly brought with him would suffice in half million acres of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 60 separate searchers and three separate dog teams scoured the woods looking for Derek, searching over 70 miles worth of trails and woods near where his car was found, not being able to find anything. And they really pushed the limits of how far they were going to search. They were rappling down cliff faces and searching behind and in any crevices or any nooks and crannies they could possibly find with no trace of Derek anywhere. And pretty soon, like wildfire, Appalachian trail hikers were now spreading the word to anyone who would listen and who was passing through the area, hoping to find a trace of Derek somewhere. But despite the presence of many people going in and out of the park, especially during this time of the year where it was beautiful and lots of sunshine, no one had seen Derek anywhere, all throughout the Smoky Mountain. And it wasn't long before people began considering the fact that he had most likely gone off the trail, whether that be purposeful or not was a different story, but that it would probably be much harder to try and find him. And by the time that March 23rd had rolled around, there was still zero evidence for Derek anywhere other than his vehicle and the note and the supplies he had, there was no trace of him to be found. And it was at this point that the search was now scaled back into smaller groups of searchers to try and stay on more populated areas, hoping they would find something of him. What makes this case even more interesting is on Sunday, March 18th, only days into the search for Derek, a second man separate from Derek had vanished into the Great Smoky Mountains right near Newfound Gap. His name was Michael Cochini, he was about 23 years of age, and he too was from Nashville, Tennessee. And what's strange about him is he was last seen outside of a Walmart area that same Sunday afternoon. And like Derek, a search party of park rangers and other search rescue personnel was made up to try and find any trace of this other man, but like Derek, nothing turned up. Unlike Derek's case, however, Michael was not at all an avid fan of the outdoors nor was he a hiker or anyone enthusiastic about going out in the Smoky Mountains. So the fact that he actually went out there is a mystery. If we fast forward to the future on August 21st, 2012, searchers would actually find several items that they believed were consistent with what Michael had carried on him last and believed they belonged to him. And not too far from those remaining items found was skull fragments. On September 6, 2012, a close examination of the remains found by the county medical examiner's office in the Knoxville region came to the conclusion that yes, these are indeed Michael Cuccini's remains. What's bizarre about this is that these remains of his were only found roughly three tenths of a mile from where his car was found all the way back in March. And still, at this point, while they had found Michael Cuccini's remains, Derek was still nowhere to be found. And while they weren't exactly sure how Michael Caccini had died, there was much suspicion about him taking his own life out there. And that that was the primary reason why he went out there in seclusion was to opt himself out, unfortunately. And where one book reaches its closing chapter, the Derek Luking story still remains unknown. In fact, his missing persons case remains open to this day because according to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, Derek simply just walked off into the woods and never came back out. And by this point, he has been missing for over 10 years. Is it possible that he set off to end his life or did something else more nefarious happen to him? Did he get spooked and run and fall off a cliff and somehow injure himself and was left to die? Or... Was the note in his car truly his and he went off to take care of his own business by opting himself out, unable to cope with the loss of his grandfather whom he was very close with? I'll let you guys be the judge. On June 5th, 2014, a woman working the desk at the Wallace C. Interpretive Center in Dahlonega, Georgia, which is roughly 30 miles or so northeast of the Appalachian Trail's southern terminus at Springer Mountain, claimed to have seen an older man walking through the door and arriving up to the counter. After putting his set of keys down on the table, he offered her $200 and asked if she would keep an eye on his car that was sitting right outside the center. He then told her that he was going to be gone for the next six months and had intended to hike all the way north to Baxter State Park in Maine. The woman claimed that that's fine with her and the man left. What's very strange here is within only a few days, 
Other hikers had reported a backpack and gear as being discarded on the middle of the trail, only about a quarter mile or so away from the center. After the Union County Sheriff's deputies had recovered the backpack, they found inside the ID of the hiker, the same man who had been in the visitor center only days before. His name was Paul D. Poor, a 50-year-old construction worker from Alice, Wisconsin. The story goes that he had apparently quit his job only seven days prior and had withdrawn $5,000 from his personal bank account, telling his girlfriend that he was going to go hike the Appalachian Trail, and really that was the last time anybody had seen him or knew of where he was going. His girlfriend, being very alarmed by this news, had contacted the sheriff's office informing them that her boyfriend had many, many mental health issues, as well as many physical ailments, including high blood pressure and having been recently diagnosed as a schizophrenic. And back in March of 2014, Paul had already attempted suicide once and his girlfriend feared that he may be trying to go and do it again. And it was at that point that the sheriff's deputies kind of connected all the dots, figuring that he surely was going to go carry this out. It's possible that Paul's backpack was just a means to trick and deceive the people at the center to make them believe that he really was going to hike up the trail, but was really going to be discarded in the end. I mean, it had all of his equipment with him, his clothing, his GoPro, his GPS, food, his tent and sleeping bag, everything you need to survive. And among all of that was $3,000. But it gets even more strange because several other hikers saw a man fitting Paul's description, but hiking with nothing but a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops on, using a garbage bag as a sleeping bag. So clearly, maybe he wasn't out to take himself out, but maybe he was just severely mentally ill, and who knows what he was doing. After the sheriff's office had pinged Paul's cell phone to try and find his last location, it had pinged in Cleveland, Ohio. As it had turned out, Paul had turned off his phone only days before arriving in Dahlonega. But things began to become more and more evident that his only intention was not to take himself out, as he was seen multiple times on Deep Gap on June 7th, as well as June 8th, both in Georgia. Then, on June 17th, he was seen climbing the Wesser Bald in North Carolina's Great Smoky Mountains. But Paul's story gets much more interesting, when on June 10th, apparently, he had spent the night with a camper at the Standing Indian Shelter in North Carolina. This hiker reported that Paul had spent the entire night reading the New Testament of the Bible and talked a lot about God and Christianity and overall just religion. And it's possible that Paul, perhaps who was out on the Appalachian Trail, was seeking some sort of spiritual adventure, but that's just his guess. According to Paul's brother, Paul was an avid hunter, an avid fisherman. He loved the outdoors. He was very experienced and very well versed in that environment up in Wisconsin. So it's possible he wanted to leave his old life behind and find solace in the wilderness by himself with only very little. And what seems very strange to me is while at Wesser Ball, Paul had accepted at least a week's worth of provisions from other concerned hikers who saw the minimal amount of gear he was packing around and the clothing he was sporting. So as the story began to change and people began seeing him, it really squashed the theory that he was originally out there to opt himself out. It's very possible that Paul wanted to challenge himself to the most extreme by getting into the most extreme conditions possible with the very little amount of gears possible. And unfortunately, after some time later, nobody knows what became of Paul. It's possible he's still wandering the trail, lost and perhaps doesn't ever want to be found. If you guys enjoyed today's video, be sure to go ahead and slap that like button and leave a comment down below. I would love to know your guys' thoughts about today's video. Also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and hit that big ol' red subscribe button as it greatly helps this channel. As always guys, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next video. Jeremy Foyer had worked as a park ranger in the Mount Rainier National Park in and around 2014. He had lived within the confines of the park, but primarily would stay at the Sunrise Visitor Center on the weekends. During the time of this account, it was around 3.30 in the morning, and Jeremy was driving up kind of a more rockier, mountainous road in very dense fog. And his headlights were able to cut through just enough to where he could see where he was going. Now this night, there was very little moonlight and much to see around him, so he's going slow, he's clutching the wheel, trying his best to just navigate his way through this road. And like most other accounts, he sees something that terrifies him. As he's coming around a bend in the mountain road, 
he catches movement off to his right. And at first he thinks it's a person because it wasn't an animal, like how it would be when crouched down on all fours, but more standing up. And as he starts to slow down, he's doing probably roughly about 20, 25 miles an hour. He sees this figure stop and get right about to the edge of the road. And he's coming around this bend at the same time. So just out of the dim lighting, he could see a figure. But as his headlights round the bend and begin to shine and partially illuminate this figure, he immediately notices that this was not a person at all, but rather an animal or creature of some sort and a bipedal one at that. Now, his description of this creature that he saw was that it was no taller than a man, probably roughly maybe around 5'8 to 5'11, because he's about 5'10 himself and said that it was about his same height, but he said it looked just like a person, just very hairy, and that the head was distinctly that of a German shepherd or similar to a timber wolf, and that as soon as it came to the edge of the road, it stopped turned its head and looked directly into his eyes. And immediately, he comes to a complete stop, his mouth is wide open, and he's staring at this thing in complete disbelief with his brain now trying to process. And judging by its appearance, he could immediately tell this was not some person coming down the mountainside in a werewolf costume. This looked far too real, and he could see the muscles rippling underneath its chest and body and speaking of which, the fur and skin right around the chest and the biceps were very thin, meaning that you could see muscle definition. You could see its chest contract and expand as it took its breath. Even seeing the hot breath in the cold night air and its eyes glowing this amberish yellow color looking right at him. And as he's staring at this thing, his eyes kind of slowly begin to go down and he notices at its sides were human hands, or at least human-like hands, where it had four fingers and an opposable. They just had long three to four inch claws at the end of them, but he said if there was ever a living werewolf that this was it, even though he understands the ridiculous notion claiming that this creature looked similar to a fictitious animal, but that's what it was. Or so he's convinced it was some kind of animal that resembles that. And almost seeming to break his gaze, this thing begins to step forward into his headlights coming directly at his vehicle. Now, as this is happening, he's still locked in shock, mouth open. And Jeremy also looks and notices that unlike a dog, which has hawks, this thing has legs just like a man. Knees bent a very specific way with ankles and large feet. And this thing is just casually strolling through right to his vehicle. At this point, Jeremy doesn't know what to do. Not only is he confused, but now he's incredibly frightened. And immediately he goes to look down and put the car in reverse. And as he goes to do that, he feels something hit the car. And immediately he looks up and sees that this thing has now cleared the short distance in a matter of only seconds and is now putting its hand on the hood of the car, pressing it down while never ever breaking its gaze into Jeremy's eyes. The way Jeremy interprets this is that it was threatening him or at least trying to be the alpha one, the dominant one, letting Jeremy know, you're in my territory, you better respect it. And as Jeremy took his foot off the brake pedal and slowly on the gas, his car began to drift down. And as he began going in reverse slowly, but also trying to speed up to get away from this thing, it just stood there as its headlights began to pull further and further back with this thing just being completely still before eventually losing all sight of it in the fog as he drove in reverse away. Jeremy at this point begins crying and breaking down because he's terrified, unsure of how to prevail against such a bizarre and terrifying creature. So he's able to regain himself after a couple of moments, realizing that this thing could still be coming toward his vehicle in the fog. And so he decides that he has no other way. He can't just reverse all the way back down this road. He has to put his car in drive and drive a little faster, hoping he won't encounter this thing in which he last saw it standing in the middle of the road right in his way. So he puts the car in drive, braces, and wishes for the best. And he goes a little bit faster this time. And within a couple of hundred yards, he gets to the exact same spot that he had seen this wolf creature at but it's nowhere to be found. And so he's not even bothering to look around or check his surroundings. He just wants to get off this dirt road so he can go home. Fortunately, Jeremy makes it past without any incident, but as he is now past this point, ah, breathing a sigh of relief that it is over, he notices something in his rearview mirror. 
so he's driving now hoping he could see the fog clearing up a bit so he's hoping he can get down to the road he sees this thing coming out of the fog running towards his vehicle but now on all fours jeremy incredibly frightened by what he's now seeing in his rearview mirror decides to speed up even more and after a little ways he's able to get through the fog as it kind of clears up as he's descending in elevation this chase only lasted for about 45 or so seconds never fully catching up to his vehicle but getting very close and just like that, along with the fog, this thing disappears. And now that he's low enough in elevation, he doesn't see it anymore. Jeremy was fortunate to be able to make it home safely without any other incident or anything following him or any other sightings. Jeremy would move at the end of 2014 to Pennsylvania, where he continued his career as a park ranger in the Forest Service. And since that night, Jeremy Foyer has not had any other encounters like this. This first story is submitted by Dylan. In August of 2011, Dylan was working as a seasonal employee park ranger at the Deep Creek Campground in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It was right around midnight when he had left to drive back to his home on the other side of the park. He had taken this route many times before, and it is usually very dark with only sparse lighting. On this night, however, the moon was out and very full, and so visibility was much better than usual. As he's driving down a road, Deep Creek Road, which takes you south down into Bryson City, something had caught his eye up ahead near some trees on the side of the road by an old picnic table that has since been removed due to age and rot. At first, Dylan thought it might be a bear because there are black bear all over the south, but then he realized how oddly shaped it was compared to that of a normal black bear, especially standing upright, like this one did. What he estimated was a creature that stood about seven to eight feet tall with what appeared to be long flowing black hair covering its entire body except for its face, which appeared more human-like than anything else although it was hard to tell from the angle he was at and the lighting conditions he was in. Its arms were not as large as you would expect from an animal of this size, but instead more thin and lankier with very long bony fingers. Dylan only saw it for about 10 seconds as he continued driving, but that was enough time to give him a very eerie feeling in the pit of his stomach and make him wonder exactly what he had just seen. As soon as he got home, he tells his wife about what had happened and at first, like usual, she seemed very skeptical until he went on to describe exactly what he had seen in more detail. And although she didn't mention Bigfoot or Sasquatch because she doesn't really know much about them, she thought that it was very possible that that's what it could have been. And for a long time, Dylan had a really hard time accepting this and processing this experience until he got to talk to some other persons working in the park about some similar sightings. One of the staff, specifically to whom he became very close with while they worked, detailed several sightings that she had had while working within the park herself. This really opened Dylan's eyes to the fact that this area is probably more active with these kind of creatures more than he had ever imagined. He has since then become a believer and is convinced that whatever he saw was most likely a Sasquatch of some kind. Now, the first sighting his coworker had described to him was back in 1997 at the Deep Creek area, where she too saw a large bipedal creature moving across the road in front of her vehicle while she was driving. Since then, she has also had several other sightings within the park and along nearby roads. Both the areas are very close to one another, as well as the sighting location that Dylan had which makes him feel even more certain that this is a hot spot for these creatures in the area. But the creature he saw, unlike his coworker, was not as big and bulky, and although tall, more thin and slender. The creature in which she had seen, she described it as more apish looking, while the one he had seen, although more slender and tiny, seemed more human in appearance. Both Dylan and his coworker have seen a multitude of black bears in the area many times before. Dylan describes not hearing any sounds as this thing moved across the road in front of him, but also described that the engine kind of drowned out any other noise along with the radio, but said that this putrid odor filled up the cabin of his vehicle. It was a putrid odor of rotting meat and urine, as Dylan described it and similar to his coworker who had had another encounter with one of these things in 2005 when she too was driving down a similar road during the summer and the early evening hours. She saw a large upright creature like the previous creature she had seen and what Dylan had seen, 
upright, standing on hind legs next to the road near a tree. She described this one as being around eight feet tall, gray, large head, shoulders, long arms, and virtually no neck. Unlike the first one, she said this one's build was much larger. And while she actually suspects the first creature she saw to be a female, judging by its shape and figure, this one was obviously a male, judging by its muscle definition and its overall shape of body. Unlike the first encounter, this one seemed to act aggressively towards her. And she said that it actually took a few steps toward her car as if it was getting ready to do a bluff charge. She described it as very intense, very frightening, and very aggressive. In the time since then, Dylan had heard of other sightings in and around the area, but couldn't recall any off the top of his head. There is also Native American tribe reservations nearby, not too far, and they've also reported sightings in that area as well, and each tribe has many stories of their own. In fact, they might be the best persons to go to for stories just like this one. So what do you think? Did Dylan and his coworker truly see something out of this world, or is this simply three misidentifications of a black bear? I'll let you decide. Our next story comes from Kevin. Now, before he details his own experience with the unknown, he wished to keep his name private. So we'll call him Kevin for the story. In 2015, Kevin worked as a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park for about seven months during the spring and summertime. If you don't know much about this park, it's a very large area with many different sections. Gorgeous, gorgeous park filled with many different types of trees and plants and plenty of wildlife to go around and Kevin had worked in one of these smaller sections right around Cades Cove, actually. It's a very popular area for tourists and hikers, and he worked in the visitor center, which is located along a small mountain road. The area has plenty of hiking trails, cabins, and campgrounds abound. The area can also be secluded with thick trees, shrubbery, and bushes. There are plenty of small roads that lead to dead ends or small hidden cabins. The area is very beautiful, but also has a dark side that Kevin assures not too many people know about. It's home to plenty of black bears and other wildlife, and it's not too uncommon to hear of hikers or tourists having run-ins with large black bears, but most just ignore them. He's also heard stories from other rangers and visitors who have had run-ins with strange creatures. However, what he had encountered this evening in the spring was in fact no bear. He still has no explanation for what it was. He was working in the evening shift, which is always very slow. It's a good time to relax and listen to music while you take in the views of the mountains and trees. One of his favorite times to work was during this evening because it was so peaceful and quiet. And on this particular night, he had decided to take a walk down one of the smaller roads to clear his head, listening to the sounds of the nightlife while taking in the fresh air and sights around him. It's during these moments that Kevin always felt at peace. As he was walking down the road, taking in everything around him, his peaceful walk was suddenly interrupted by this loud growling noise coming from the bushes next to him. He stops, looks around, but could not see what was making the noise. However, what it sounded like was big enough to devour him whole, he claims. So he slowly backs away from the bushes while keeping his eyes on them, and as he did so, something flies up out of the thicket near up in a tree. And what his eyes looked at, appear to be a giant bat of some kind. However, once perched, it looked down on him with these hideous glowing eyes and a beak face. He's never felt such evil overcome his entire being. This thing was not of this world, he claims. Kevin says that this was around five feet tall, covered in dark brown gangly matted fur with a wingspan of around eight to 10 feet. The face looked like that of a bat or a pterosaur of some kind, but far more demonic, with a long curved beak. Its eyes were glowing yellow and it had a hideous beak like a mouth. It simply sat there and watched him with this evil grin shown on its face. Kevin, surprised and unsure what to do next, slowly backs away from the creature while keeping his eyes locked onto it. It was as if something was taunting it to come closer. He doesn't know how long this encounter lasted for because when you're in the throes of it, time slows down to a halt. But once he had created enough distance between him and this creature, it simply vanished into the trees and was gone just like that. And once he knows it's clear, he runs back to the visitor center, trying his best to keep a professional composure, which wasn't exactly easy. He tells his coworkers about what happened, but they all laugh at him and think he's crazy. He still doesn't know to this day what it was that was out there or where it had come from. 
and it's still hands down one of the most terrifying moments in his life, and he will never forget it. Since then, he's tried to do research during his time and has not been able to come to any rational or logical conclusions as to what this could be, simply because there are a myriad of species of bats living within Tennessee, but what he saw was no ordinary bat. This thing was easily the size of a small child, maybe eight to 10 years old. I mean, he's talking humongous, possibly even the size of a condor, if not a little larger, but this was no condor. This thing, as he described, looked more like a pterosaur from hell than anything else. In fact, the only thing that was bat-like about it was its wings and how they appeared to be all tattered and leathery. He stated that he has seen plenty of bats in his life so he knows what they look like, but this was no bat. Even if it didn't have an outstanding reputation for mysteries, Canada's own Nahani National Park Reserve would nonetheless remain a remarkable place. Situated parallel to Alaska and the nation's Northwest Territories, the park claims nearly 12,000 square miles of wilderness with canyons as deep as 3,300 feet bordering its turbulent Whitewater River. Its thick forest and majestic waterfalls, like Angel Falls, which stretches twice as high as Niagara, earned Nahani National Park Reserve the distinction of the first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yet, for all its beauty, the Nahani Valley only receives around 1,000 visitors per year, fewer than many parks see in a single day. The valley is virtually untouched, thanks to its remote location, Nahani is only accessible by air or water. And to visit, tourists might either charter a small float plane or bush plane or brave the South Nahani River. On top of all of this, the park is associated with an alarming amount of unexplained phenomena. Before it was a national park, explorers, often seeking the Nahani Valley's long rumored gold deposits, would simply vanish and their bodies never recovered at all. Whenever remains were eventually discovered, they were often mutilated, even beheaded, earning Nahani the infamous nickname, the Headless Valley, or Valley of the Headless Men. Even those fortunate enough to come out alive might still emerge mad or crazy. Others kept their sanity, but told fantastic tales of animals twice as big as anywhere else, or strange monsters like hairy giants, malevolent spirits, and living fossils like dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, and dire wolves, all inhabiting a mystical land that time somehow forgot. While modern conveniences have now made Nahani National Park Reserve safer than in the past, similar stories do persist to this day. Many of the beliefs surrounding the valley have been handed down to us from the Diné people, who settled in the area some 10,000 or so years ago. Nahani was particularly important to the Daicho people, one of over 20 Diné tribes in the region. The Daicho, also called the Slavey, would often leave simple offerings like tobacco alongside the Nahani Valley's many hot springs, hoping to encourage good luck by appeasing the spirits of the land. Because of this sacred nature, Nahani retains a certain secretive quality to this day. Many portions of the park remain strictly off limits to the general public. Documentarians wishing to film on river must sometimes wait through lengthy approval periods by authorities. No one argues that the Nahani Valley's restricted access isn't a result of its cultural and environmental significance. However, given the strange things that happen here, we are left wondering if an ulterior motive might not be at play. Spurred by the Klondike Gold Rush of the late 19th century, an estimated 100,000 prospectors descended upon northern Canada seeking fortune and fame. It was a frenzy of diminishing returns. Of these, no more than 40,000 reached their destination, with only half of them actually trying their hand at prospecting. Only a few hundred of the 4,000 who found any meaningful amount of gold actually became rich. This craze brought some prospectors into the Nahani Valley, and they came back with the wildest tales. One of the earliest contemporary legends surrounding the valley is that somewhere within its borders, the valley holds a lush tropical paradise, always free of snow and cold. Even in winter, it is uncomfortably warm. It's water fed by hot springs. Stories often placed this Canadian Shangri-La somewhere in the high mountain pass. 
This Yukon jungle allegedly held miraculous flora and fauna unlike anywhere else in the region or on Earth. Palm trees popped up from the permafrost, 60-foot vines spiraled to the heavens, ferns and nettles stood taller than any man, and rose bushes supported stems as thick as forearms. The mountain sheep, moose, and caribou there lived such good lives that they verged on being fat. Despite this bounty, local tribes allegedly avoided the area at all costs. Something left massive three-toed prints throughout the tropical valley, perhaps a relic from a bygone era. The tropical valley of Nahani has never been found, obviously. And today, most believe that these tales were inspired by the area's numerous hot springs, some of which do heat the surrounding soil enough to encourage lush undergrowth. While the tropical valley seems fictitious, its unnatural megafauna are much better documented. Woolly mammoth and mastodon remains litter the utmost regions of Northern America and indigenous artwork from around the Nahani Valley often depicts the creatures pretty accurately. Elephant bones give a poor idea of what their owners actually looked like. For example, their skulls offer no obvious indication of their trunks. Therefore, we are left wondering exactly how tribes people knew what woolly mammoths looked like. Perhaps their ancestors who hunted the creatures handed down descriptions of woolly mammoths over generations, or perhaps they encountered them firsthand themselves. Some tribes claim that large creatures resembling mammoths still lumber through Canada today. Explorers to the Northern Territories also told of similar tales, because in 1887, fur trader Cola F. Fowler said that a tribal chief had handed him a large ivory tusk, too large to belong to a walrus, with obvious signs of fresh flesh and blood. The chief claimed it had been killed only three months prior and even drew a picture of an elephant in the dirt. If not mammoths, then another prehistoric survival might exist in the valley. A tribal informant had told cryptozoologist Ivan T. Sanderson that the apex predator of the Nahani was a lion. Not a puma or a cougar, but an actual maned lion, and bigger than any other specimen on Earth. Some cryptozoologists speculate that the Nahani lion could represent a relic population of saber-toothed cats, or even the American lion a species supposedly roaming from Alaska to Mexico some 11,000 years ago. Like the ones rumored to roam Nahani, the American lion was larger than its modern cousins by a full 25%. Of course, a lion would be no match for a dinosaur. An indigenous guide in Nahani told scientists that a wandering member of the Cree people had made his way to the valley long ago. In his words, the wanderer met a primitive tribe armed with bone-shod javelins and clubs made from the jawbones of the moose. Around their fires, these Stone Age people had told of a medicine valley to the north, inhabited by monsters of fearful size and ferocity. As proof, they offered the wanderer a gift, a piece of buckskin burned with an image of the creature. And at this point in his tale, the guide relating this story to the scientist presented the scrap, which clearly showed a dinosaur drawn in flawless anatomical detail. Even if these living fossils are simply legends, reputable sources indicate that other animals in Nahani grow far larger than anywhere else. A moose from the valley caught on film in 1970 displayed a set of antlers estimated to span 12 feet long, double the average size. Grizzlies the size of a young moose, measuring a dozen feet tall on their hind legs, have also been reported in Nahani. By comparison, the largest Kodiak bears rarely exceed 10 feet. In fact, one witness described a bear he saw there in the 1970s as the size of an Abrams tank. That same decade, John and Joanne Moore saw a small black bear in Nahani behaving strangely. After watching it for a time, they determined that it was actually a massive porcupine. The Moors were not likely to have exaggerated their sighting, nor to have been mistaken. They were seasoned adventurers after all. In fact, Moors Hot Springs in Nahani National Park Reserve is actually named after the pair. In addition to the Diné, another secretive tribe called Nahani their home, sharing their name with the valley itself. It is widely regarded that the use of the word Nahani to describe the area today referred to these inhabitants, but no one can decide on exactly what the name of the tribe itself meant. One of the earliest claims is that Nihani, 
either meant mountain people or people over there, far away. It may also be a corrupted form of the word Nahanike, an indigenous term signifying the people who speak like ducks, perhaps referencing how the Nahani language differed from that of the Diné. Given the prefix na and the fear with which the Diné describe them, Nahani may roughly translate to hostile or enemy. Details on the mysterious Nahani people are sparse beyond that they actually existed in some form or fashion whether they were a distinct tribe or an isolated pocket of a larger nation remains hotly debated among anthropologists today. Neighboring tribes sometime referred to the Nahani people as sheepmen for the sheepskin clothing that they wore. Others, like the Decho Dine, regarded them with fear, describing them in their legends as enormous malevolent giants. This is another possible origin for the name Nahani. Nahedi, a word for the Nahani River, means river of giants. This fearsome reputation preceded the Nihani whenever they made contact with the world outside. Word spread among Canadian explorers that the people of the Nahani Valley, if they were encountered at all, were highly aggressive towards outsiders, defending their land at all costs before retreating to the mountains. However, the historical record contradicts this superstition. Early settlers, including those from the famous Hudson's Bay Company, described the Nihani as wary but hospitable to visitors, their tribe both intellectual and resourceful. Unfortunately, these interactions were relatively rare, and their final interaction with the outside world occurred in 1929, the same year an influenza epidemic spread through the community, and the few tribe members who didn't succumb were absorbed into other tribes. The Nahani's reclusive nature and subsequent disappearance fostered an air of mystery about them. Rumors persisted that a matriarch led the tribe, a white queen of European descent whose presence evokes images of the fairy queen presiding over her subjects. This likely originated in a misreading of an 1838 account describing a fair-skinned authoritative female leader of the Nahani. It nonetheless speaks to how the tribe has been mythologized over the years. Was it a flu that wiped out the Nahani or a curse? Explorers found that anyone overnighting in the ruins of Nahani settlements contracted a highly infectious, mysterious illness themselves. In Diné legend, this might have been attributed to the Soneteye, the most feared of all great spirits who inflicted disease with the help of demons who called the Nahani Valley their home. The Tsoneteye is far from the only dangerous entity found here. In indigenous belief, the entire area is haunted. While some spirits were helpful, a great number were dangerous. Lesser powers inhabited every animal, plant, rock, and landmark of the valley and were capable of inflicting great harm on anyone disturbing their environment. Countless Dene hunters walked into Nahani never to return, victims of the land's bad medicine. Others found that the trails of the animals they tracked simply ended as if their quarry vanished into thin air or were swallowed by the earth itself. Today, many still believe that these spirits and the curses they created cling to the Nahani Valley, the source of its many deaths and disappearances. One notable spirit dwells in the caves along the South Nahani River. According to tribal lore, it is known for making people disappear like smoke in the wind. Its hideous wails can be heard drifting on the breeze at night. While on an expedition to Nahani, journalist Pierre Breton experienced this sound firsthand. He described a low howling whine that swept out of the mountain down into the valley, died, and rose again in greater intensity. The banshee wail made our hackles rise, for this was, without a doubt, the spirit sound so many men talked and whispered about. Even when this sound isn't heard, an oppressive feeling hovers over Nahani. Frank Henderson said in the 1940s that there is absolutely no denying the sinister atmosphere of the whole valley. Depending on the legend, the park's eerie landmarks, including its many caves and thin spires of rock called hoodoos, either housed, attracted, or were created by these spirits themselves. These spirits sometimes make themselves explicitly known. In July of 2010, Anthony Roche, a Parks Canada employee of Indigenous descent, was preparing for winter in Nahani by clearing trails and collecting firewood for the warden's cabin. Although no tourists were allowed in this portion of the park at the time, due to the forest fires, he found companionship in two other employees, 
Bob and Amy, who eventually joined him at the cabin. One day, Anthony and Bob dozed off in their bunk beds while Amy washed dishes in the kitchen. After a time, Anthony heard her stop. Everything fell silent in the cabin, and a short time later, Anthony became aware of someone, presumably Amy, walking from the kitchen into the bunk room. The presence tapped him on his heel. Anthony grumbled a reply, assuming Amy wanted him to finish the dishes. He dozed off, only to be briefly awoken again by a light shake on the shoulder. Finally, the footsteps angrily stomped back into the bunk room, and Anthony was forcefully shaken awake. The footsteps stormed out of the room before he opened his eyes, and when he looked, there was nobody there. After using the outhouse, Anthony returned to the cabin, only to find Amy herself asleep on the couch. When he woke her up, she denied ever entering the bunk room. Bob said that he had been asleep the entire time as well. Even if he was lying, Bob had been on the top bunk, and there was no way he could have climbed down without Anthony noticing. A month later, Anthony was helping a student and other co-workers film a promotional video for Nahani. At one point, they were alarmed by a strange call from the forest. It sounded like a raven, but was clearly a human being imitating a raven. Tourists were still restricted in the area, and Anthony looked to one of the senior park employees for an answer. His companion only cryptically replied, he's just letting us know he's there. Within moments, the wind picked up, carrying the unmistakable sound of a woman singing. This time, none of Anthony's co-workers could offer any explanation other than that they all agreed it sounded exactly like singing. What would have happened if this singing spirit had approached the park employees? They might have gone mad. Numerous tales of individuals emerging insane from the Nahani Valley stretch back into indigenous lore, with more modern accounts verified in the historical record. For example, bush pilots checking on the well-being of five prospectors in 1960 were met with a grisly scene. From the two survivors, they pieced together the details. The prospector's flower supply had begun to run low, and judging from the moose and caribou carcasses present, they had turned to hunting big game in the park. None of them had dressed the animals, however, and simply left them in the field. Instead, the men butchered and ate their own dogs, sometimes waiting until they were so rotten that their skin sloughed off at the slightest touch. Another prospector consumed the guts of a caribou but left all the actual meat to rot in the sun. In their desperation and madness, one of the men killed himself with the last of their dynamite far off in the forest. When they learned of this tragedy, two prospectors set off for help but never returned, leaving the final two survivors to languish deliriously in their cabin. Another unfortunate victim of Nahani's madness was a prospector named Joe, who set up a simple log cabin in Nahani around 1914, when a rescue party looking for a missing person in the valley stumbled upon him, and they found his face severely scratched, an eye swollen shut. They asked Joe if he and his prospecting partner Red had been fighting. Joe mumbled something about being abandoned and fighting blue devils in the mountains that he now had imprisoned in a box. Joe rushed back to his cabin, fetching a small wooden container and instructed the rescuers to follow him into the wilderness. They reluctantly obliged, but after a time began to suspect that the box was full of gunpowder. The other men tackled Joe. To their relief, they found that the box only included matches and baking powder. After a brief struggle, realization washed over Joe's face, and he finally recognized his visitors, having met them before. They brought him back to the cabin where they hid his cutlery and bandaged his wounds, supposedly obtained in a fall. A short time thereafter, they found Red, who had fled into the wilderness to escape Joe's madness. In the coming weeks, Joe seemed to calm down and the pair resumed their prospecting. However, he eventually started inventing bizarre rituals and culminating in the construction of a sacrificial altar on a mountaintop. This was the final straw. Red took Joe back to civilization for medical treatment. Beyond malevolent spirits, a more sinister curse is said to afflict Nahani. Legend holds that the best way to avoid coming to harm in the valley is to leave the soil untouched. Anyone who removes minerals from the earth, especially gold, meets an untimely end. There seems to be some truth behind this prohibition. Not only are there plenty examples from the Nahani Valley, but similar taboos can be found all around the world. 
For instance, visitors to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park are strictly warned against taking rocks from the area. In addition to the legal penalties of removing such items from the U.S. national parks, it is believed that anyone who does so invites the wrath of Hawaii's volcano god, Pele. Each year, Volcanoes National Parks receive hundreds of packages, each containing sand and rock taken from the site, returned by tourists trying to change their newfound bad luck. Whereas Pele values obsidian, whatever lurks in the Northwest Territories seems to covet gold and it refuses to let it leave. The prospectors who died in Nahani Valley are the source of its most enduring mystery a string of headless corpses stretching through the years. The intense interest that prospectors showed towards Nahani began in 1900, when a Diné tribesman named Little Nahani brought a quartz sample from the valley into town. It was richly veined in gold. Now, according to one story, local tribes had endeavored to keep the valley's gold a secret, but Little Nahani changed all of that. When a second Diné brought more gold from the river, four years later, the Nahani Valley was inundated with prospectors, a flood which had diminished to a trickle by the time brothers Willie and Frank McLeod had actually set out in 1908. By all accounts, Willie was the quintessential frontiersman, capable of living off the land and tracking game better than anybody else at the time. When he first found gold in Nahani in 1905, Willie filled an entire box with samples, but tragically lost them when they spilled overboard in the river. Undeterred, he returned and was able to pan 10 ounces worth of nuggets. He soon enlisted his brother, Frank, and a young engineer from Scotland by the name of Weir. That was the last anyone saw of any of them alive, at least. Like so many other tales from the era, the rest of the McLeod story is hard to precisely pin down, with newspaper narratives offering conflicting details. What is generally agreed upon is that two to three years later, Willie and Frank's brother Charlie set out to find his missing siblings. He eventually discovered them along the river in a part of Nahani known as Dead Man's Valley. Both had been murdered. Their heads were missing. And some stories featured their heads intact, their bodies sporting gunshot wounds. The McLeod brothers appeared to have been killed in their sleep. One skeleton's arm was still outstretched, reaching for a now rusty rifle resting against a spruce tree. Charlie identified his brother's remains from their personal effects, as well as a note scrawled in their hand. We have found a fine prospect. Sure enough, a magnificent hoard of gold-bearing quartz sat in a box nearby, untouched. Who would kill them and leave this fortune behind? Ware was certainly a suspect, but according to the original story, he was never found. And now, decades later, Charlie would claim that he found and confronted Ware only to have him kill himself. Now, nine years after the McLeod's expedition, another prospector, Martin Jorgensen, struck gold in Nahani as well. He sent a message to his acquaintance, Poole Field, who set out to rendezvous with Jorgensen. Along the way, Poole met the mad prospector Joe. Poole finally crossed the divide, but was shocked to find Jorgensen's cabin burned to the ground. As for Jorgensen himself, his dead body lay nearby, missing its head. Such decapitations would continue on and off during the decades, including an Ontario miner who was found beheaded in a sleeping bag in 1945. What is responsible for these mutilations? Many explanations have been offered throughout the years, but the official position is that an animal scavenger is somehow taking these missing heads. In addition to Weir, the Nihani people were blamed for the McLeod's death since some believe that the tribe were avid headhunters. Whether or not this was true is anyone's guess. There is some evidence that tribes further to the west along Alaska's coast may have engaged in headhunting practices. However, many of the region's other tribes were mostly peaceful among those that weren't. Their mutilations focused predominantly on scalping, not decapitation. Were animals to blame, or humans? Some split the difference and believe that something neither animal nor human earned the Headless Valley its nickname. Whenever discussing the Nahani Valley, the specter of giants looms large. They are inseparably woven into the oldest legends of the place, evidenced by the Daicho Diné's impression of the Nahani tribespeople as tall and murderous. These tales melded with the Diné stories about another tribe, the Naha, to the extent that many people think the Nahani people around the Naha were one and the same. However, other tribes thought that the Naha were far more primitive than the Nahani. 
literal holdovers from the Stone Age. What's more is that they are rarely described as surviving into the modern era, whereas we have first-hand testimonies from encounters with the Nihani tribe. One line of thinking holds that the Naha didn't go extinct, but instead migrated far to the south encroaching into America where they settled as the Navajo. Indeed, the Navajo tribe is believed to have relocated sometime in prehistory from northwestern Canada to the American Southwest. To make matters more confusing, the Nahani tribe and the Naha further conflated with stories of gigantic headhunters called the Nakani. Now, according to Dene legend, the Nakani lurk just beyond the light of campfire, leaving strange footprints in the forest and making ominous noises at night throwing sticks and stones to torment their victims. Their eyes are red, their arms are muscular, and they are entirely covered in foul-smelling hair. Neither firearms nor blades can harm them. In the words of one author, they delighted in killing all things they can reach by cutting off their heads. The Dine lived in perpetual fear of the Nakani. One of the earliest settlers to speak of the Nakani was a missionary by the name of Emile Petito, who in 1876, wrote that the Diné live at times in continual terror of an imaginary enemy who pursues them without rest, who they believe to see everywhere even though he doesn't exist at all. We all know what this sounds like. Bigfoot, could these creatures be responsible for the gruesome deaths and mysterious disappearances that plague the park? Is there mention related to any of the other mysterious disappearances in any other of the national parks? Sightings of large hairy creatures sometimes identified as Nakani, persist throughout the Northern Territories. What's more, footprints shaped like a human's but far too large and not wearing any shoes have been found in the Nihani Valley. Perhaps one of the first outsiders to encounter the Nakani in Nihani was John McLeod. Something pelted his 1831 expedition with stones from the forest, and in 1914, Poole Field, who on the same trip both encountered the mad prospector Joe and found Martin Jorgensen's headless body, and noticed that something was throwing rocks and branches at them as they sat around the campfire. The rescue party's dogs went berserk, but they could never locate their invisible assailant. Eventually, a scout killed what he thought was a Nakani chasing him. Unfortunately, it turned out to be one of his fellow Diné. Eight years earlier, Jerry Walker and a man named Sam were prospecting in the Nahani Valley when several Nakani, described as monkey men, encircled their camp from out of the fog. They called across the campfire to one another in whistles and hoots, forcing the witnesses to huddle as close as possible to the campfire for protection. When dawn finally came, the men relocated but again were surrounded by Nakani. The beast crept closer than before, causing Sam to panic and draw his firearm. He took off into the fog after one of the hairy beasts, and shortly thereafter, Jerry heard him screaming from deep within the woods. Because of the dense mist, he could do nothing but sit and listen. According to the story, Jerry found Sam's corpse stripped of flesh. Predictably, his head was nowhere to be found. The Nakani is regarded as being tall, at least the size of a man, a much smaller wild man, known as the Nukluk, also appears in the vicinity of Nahani. In fact, the creature has shown itself no less than three times in 1964 in the Nahani Butte, a community on the outskirts of the park. In April, an elderly indigenous witness and his friends encountered a short, naked, muscular, bearded man-shaped creature in the woods. When they offered a greeting, it growled and bolted into the forest. And in May, a Diné woman was weaving a basket at dusk when she felt someone watching her through the window. She looked up but saw nothing and returned to her work. When she looked back again a bit later, a hideous face, identical in description to the creature seen a month earlier, stared back at her. She and two of her children went outside to track down the little man, but it was nowhere to be found. Finally, a 14-year-old boy named Jerry saw the creature that autumn at his home near a local landfill. It was 9 p.m. when he heard his dog barking outside, and by the time Jerry and his father went to comfort their pet, it was completely calm and quiet. Perplexed, the father flicked on his flashlight, looking for a source of all this commotion, and after turning his beam in the direction of a slight sound, the father illuminated a short figure staring back at them. The Nukluk was covered in fur. The hair was colored light brown, with the exception of its head, which was instead dark black and tapered to a point. 
It held a stone club in its hands and seemed to wear a leather garment of moose skin at the waist. Oddly enough, its feet were covered in rubber boots. The witnesses and the Nukluk stared at one another for a long few moments before the dog started barking once more, sending the creature across the property and over the road. Its presence caught the eye of several witnesses who chased the creature, but they abandoned pursuit once it ducked into the bushes. In 1965, outdoorsman Frank Graves spotted something in the Nahani Valley that made his blood run cold. It was enormous and covered in a white hair. At first, he thought it was a polar bear that had found its way far south, but as he watched, Graves could tell that this thing looked more like a dog or a wolf than any bear. Graves had encountered plenty of wolves in his time, and this was 20 times larger than any wolf he had ever seen. Reflexively, he hit it with a blast of his birdshot, but the animal barely reacted, simply turning away to lumber off into the trees. Now, according to his Dene guide, Graves had encountered what they referred to as Wahila, easily the most famous cryptid of the Nahani Valley. These creatures resemble immense wolves, but never travel in packs. Their heads are proportionally wider than wolves, their ears smaller, and their tails are thickly muscled like an otter's. Locals had long suspected that Willie and Frank McLeod, like the lions, some speculate that the Wahila is a relict animal which survived extinction, maybe a dire wolf. These massive canines supposedly died out between 10,000 and 16,000 years ago. The largest dire wolves stood a little over three feet tall. Wolves in Nahani Valley are known for being especially aggressive. A number of attacks have taken place over the decades. Like other megafauna found in Nahani, these specimens are often quite large for their species, and this has led some to speculate that the Wahila Frank Graves saw was simply an oversized wolf, perhaps one suffering from gigantism and ostracized from its pack. We'll likely never know for sure, but the answer may still lie somewhere in the depths of the Headless Valley. This is only the briefest sketch of the odd occurrences at Nahani National Park Reserve. For every mystery we have covered, several others lay untouched. But by far the most comprehensive book on this subject is The Legends of the Nahani Valley by Hammerson Peters. Peters' work exhaustively details the countless mysteries found in this remote corner of the Canadian wilderness. Despite its abundance of intrigue, Nahani National Park Reserve remains one of the least visited national parks in Canada. This is, of course, due to how inaccessible it remains. But inaccessible doesn't mean impossible, and if you are interested, you can investigate its mysteries firsthand. Although, with enough determination, and money of course, you can visit the Nahani Valley whenever you wish. Just be sure to go in with caution, and above all, don't lose your head. Our next story comes from Kevin. Now before he details his own experience with the unknown, he wished to keep his name private, so we'll call him Kevin for the story. In 2015, Kevin worked as a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park for about seven months during the spring and summertime. If you don't know much about this park, it's a very large area with many different sections. Gorgeous, gorgeous park filled with many different types of trees and plants and plenty of wildlife to go around. And Kevin had worked in one of these smaller sections right around Cades Cove, actually. It's a very popular area for tourists and hikers. And he worked in the visitor center, which is located along a small mountain road. The area has plenty of hiking trails, cabins and campgrounds abound the area can also be secluded with thick trees, shrubbery, and bushes. There are plenty of small roads that lead to dead ends or small hidden cabins. The area is very beautiful, but also has a dark side that Kevin assures not too many people know about. It's home to plenty of black bears and other wildlife, and it's not too uncommon to hear of hikers or tourists having run-ins with large black bears, but most just ignore them. He's also heard stories from other rangers and visitors who have had run-ins with strange creatures. However, what he had encountered this evening in the spring was in fact no bear. He still has no explanation for what it was. He was working in the evening shift, which is always very slow. It's a good time to relax and listen to music while you take in the views of the mountains and trees. One of his favorite times to work was during this evening because it was so peaceful and quiet. And on this particular night, he had decided to take a walk down one of the smaller roads to clear his head, listening to the sounds of the nightlife while taking in the fresh air and sights around him. It's during these moments that Kevin always felt at peace. As he was walking down the road, 
taking in everything around him. His peaceful walk was suddenly interrupted by this loud growling noise coming from the bushes next to him. He stops, looks around, but could not see what was making the noise. However, what it sounded like was big enough to devour him whole, he claims. So he slowly backs away from the bushes while keeping his eyes on them, and as he did so, something flies up out of the thicket near up in a tree. And what his eyes looked at appeared to be a giant bat of some kind. However, once perched, it looked down on him with these hideous glowing eyes and a beak face. He's never felt such evil overcome his entire being. This thing was not of this world, he claims. Kevin says that this was around five feet tall, covered in dark brown gangly matted fur with a wingspan of around eight to 10 feet. The face looked like that of a bat or a pterosaur of some kind, but far more demonic with a long curved beak. Its eyes were glowing yellow and it had a hideous beak like a mouth. It simply sat there and watched him with this evil grin shown on its face. Kevin, surprised and unsure what to do next, slowly backs away from the creature while keeping his eyes locked onto it. It was as if something was taunting it to come closer. He doesn't know how long this encounter lasted for because when you're in the throes of it, time slows down to a halt. But once he had created enough distance between him and this creature, it simply vanished into the trees and was gone just like that. And once he knows it's clear, he runs back to the visitor center, trying his best to keep a professional composure, which wasn't exactly easy. He tells his coworkers about what happened, but they all laugh at him and think he's crazy. He still doesn't know to this day what it was that was out there or where it had come from. And it's still hands down one of the most terrifying moments in his life, and he will never forget it. Since then, He's tried to do research during his time and has not been able to come to any rational or logical conclusions as to what this could be, simply because there are a myriad of species of bats living within Tennessee, but what he saw was no ordinary bat. This thing was easily the size of a small child, maybe 8 to 10 years old. I mean, he's talking humongous, possibly even the size of a condor, if not a little larger, but this was no condor. This thing, as he described, looked more like a pterosaur from hell than anything else. In fact, the only thing that was bat-like about it was its wings and how they appeared to be all tattered and leathery. He stated that he has seen plenty of bats in his life so he knows what they look like. But this was no bat. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is a national park in the United States. Kilauea, one of the world's most active volcanoes, and Mauna Loa the world's most enormous shield volcano, are both parts of the park. The scientists can learn about the evolution of the Hawaiian Islands and conduct research at the park. For visitors, the park offers extraordinary volcanic environments, glimpses of rare flora and fauna, and a view into the traditional Hawaiian culture linked to these scenes. Established on August 1st, 1916, Hawaii National Park was eventually divided into this park and Haleakala National Park. In acknowledgement of its exceptional natural standards, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park was allocated as an International Biosphere Reserve in 1980 and a World Heritage Site in 1987. This national park is known for not just its beauty, but also an area of superstition and mystery. You see, on March 27th, 1998, a blue eruption of light ignited the night sky along with a huge thunderous roar. Hundreds of locals called to report the event as did a pilot who was in flight at the time. The pilot alleged that the fireball came within two miles of this aircraft and he observed a dramatic increase in the temperature in the area. The pilot's testimony was endorsed by others in the place with him and officials afterward declared that the blast was nothing more than a meteor. However, that doesn't sit right. Some Hawaiian locals were not convinced. They claimed that the blast observed by so many was surely a sign of an Hawaiian god who had been awakened now and who was now enraged with what humankind was doing to the world. In fact, a Newswatch bulletin taken from that day reads this. A brilliant light gives night owls a rare treat. Islanders who happen to be up at 2.41 a.m. today were treated to a spectacular light show in the sky. I wish I'd seen it, said Bishop Museum Planetarium Manager Peter McCod, who was asleep and missed it. It was probably a once in a lifetime to see. But what exactly was it? From talking to people who saw it and called the planetarium, McCod said it sounds like the light might have been a, a fireball or maybe a bright meteor. On the other hand, it could have been a piece of space junk, he said. A piece of satellite or discarded rocket element 
it's hard to tell. In fact, it was so bright and people did see different colors too. Sometimes that's indicative of space junk because of the different metals used in spacecraft. Now, police dispatchers on Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island, and the planetarium security guards and radio stations all received a ton of calls about the mysterious light. On Oahu, callers described it as a bluish purple. On the Big Island, where the calls came in the most from all districts, police said the light made the night sky as bright as day. The Coast Guard even said it appeared to be a large meteor traveling through the sky. And while sporadic meteors, remnants of the solar system are common, but to have one happen overhead when you happen to be looking up is pretty rare for an average individual. This is one of many odd events that have occurred on the island of Hawaii, because various tourists have removed rocks from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and then sent them back. They sent them back claiming that the unusual incidents had taken place when they arrived home with the rocks. Many believe that they had been cursed for stealing the rocks from their home. Others have stated that they had too been confronted by spirits while exploring the island late at night, as well as seeing a mysterious mist in the distance. Imagine, if you will, strange creatures, phantom campsites, and ghostly encounters, and a tree that is said to have the power to alter the weather. These things and more have been reported at Crater Lake National Park, and in tonight's episode, we're going to be looking into the strangeness that has been reported here at Crater Lake National Park. Ask a scientist about how Crater Lake was formed, and they will tell you that about 8,000 years ago, Mount Mazama erupted, and that this explosion was the largest volcano in the Cascade region in well over a million years. The force of the blast was so great that Mount Mazama blew its top off and then collapsed to form a giant crater. After 200 years of snowmelt and rainfall, a lake was formed, measuring well over 2,000 feet deep, thus making it the largest lake in North America and the ninth largest in the world. Now, ask the Kalamath natives and you'll get a more colorful story about the origins of Crater Lake. Now, before we move on, I'm going to apologize in advance that I'm still sick and getting over a cold, so bear with me. The native story goes something like this with the origins of Crater Lake that the gods created the world and the mountains, and they also created great tunnels under these mountains. Once completed, they left the earth, except one by the name of Skell. Now, Skell is known as the sky god and is usually perceived as a force of good. Now, Skell created his home on Mount Shasta. While on Mount Shasta, Skell created humankind, and Skell watched over his creation and was their great protector. However, Skell was not the only spirit around as there was another spirit known as Lao, who lived under the mountains and those great tunnels that the gods had created. He is known as the Lord of the Underworld. Now, Lao would visit the upper world and admired all of its beauty. On one such visit, he noticed a beautiful native woman named Loha. Loha was the daughter of the Kalamath chief and was said to be a beautiful woman. Many men in before him had tried to make her their wife, but none succeeded. One version of this legend states that even Skell had tried to make her his wife. However, he was turned down, and lucky for Loha, Skell was graceful with his rejection. Unfortunately for Loha, the Dark Lord Lao was determined to have her, so he dispatched his most trusted lieutenant, School, to Loha's village. He told School to send his marriage proposal to Loha. Loha then loaded School down with lavish gifts and sent him along with an entourage out toward Loha's village. That fateful evening happened to be a festival night and Loha was out taking in the festivities when out of thin air, there stood School. School was described as wearing wolf skin and having red eyes. School then proclaimed that my master, Lord Lao, intends to marry Loha. Lord Lao offers these most lavish gifts, but most importantly, he offers Loha the chance of eternal life and that she could live with him under Mount Moyena. He then flicked his fingers and all of Loha's would-be suitors vanished in a flash of yellow light. Horrified and disgusted, Loha had boldly proclaimed that, I do not want to live under a mountain, and school disappeared in an instance and went back to the mount. Meanwhile, Loha's father held an emergency tribal council. Sympathetic to his daughter's plight, he presented the idea to the tribal council that Loha should flee. The elders agreed with the chief, and it was decided Loha would flee. Now, naturally, the Dark Lord under the mountain wasn't too pleased when he had heard the news that School had for him. The Dark Lord sent School back with orders to bring her to him. School encountered a problem, though, because Loha wasn't there. 
and there was no one talking. When informed of this, the Dark Lord told School to tell the village they would all be destroyed unless they gave her up. The villagers replied with stone cold silence, but by this point, Lord Lao was furious and began to pace under the mountain. The earth began to tremble and shake as he paced back and forth and he became more furious by the moment and his fury had reached a pinnacle point that actually blew the top off of his mountain home. Still enraged, Lao climbs out to the open world and blew fire and hurled fiery boulders onto the village below. The villagers fled to a nearby lake and it was here that two medicine men decided that to stop the Dark Lord, they must sacrifice themselves. Watching from Mount Shasta, Lord Scale was moved by this act of selflessness. As the medicine men approached the mountain, Scale flew in front of them and began to battle the Dark Lord Lao. A great battle was fought, and Scale was eventually victorious after several days. He had forced Lao back into the underworld. He then sealed the opening with debris from the explosion, and this in turn formed a crater, thus sealing the entrance to the underworld shut. The Klamath changed the name of the mountain, which originally meant Tall Mountain, and they called the ensuing lake that formed Lake Giawas, which means a most sacred place. This place remained a holy place to the Kalamath tribe and hidden from the outside world for the next 7,500 years. I tell you this story because if you take it all of the theatrics, this is exactly what scientists claim to have happened. Also, it is known that the Kalamath people lived in the area at the time of this eruption. Another reason I tell you this story is to show that there can be some truths in mythology or the story is based on actual events. How much is true is to be determined. However, it's amazing that after 7,700 years, this story is still as accurate as it is. Now, one thing that caught my attention in the story was the description of school. When I first began researching strange things at Crater Lake, the first thing I saw was an early settler's claim to encounter a white deer with red eyes. However, as I began to look for the story again so that I could talk about it and provide it as a possible reference point, I immediately made the connection to school when I had read about his appearances. Now, before we move on to the next part, there's actually another story that the Klamath have. Now, this story tells how Wizard Island was formed and some people think this might have something to do with some of these strange activities at Crater Lake. The last battle, I'm assuming that happens after the previous story and this is called The Last Battle. Now, this story involves our two gods from the previous story, Skell and Lao. And before getting to the battle, this story first takes us down a memory lane trip. The story tells us that Skell and the Dark Lord were not always enemies. In fact, they were at one time friends. The tale describes Lao as coming up from the underworld and playing with Skell. They would morph into various animals and play with each other and were great friends at time. Over the course of time, things had soured between them to the point that they became mortal enemies. And one day, Skell and Lao met for battle. This particular battle would be a battle to the death, and of course the Dark Lord Lao smote down his adversary Skell. The Dark Lord was jubilant and held a massive party to celebrate his victory over Skell. However, not everybody was happy about this. The followers of Skell infiltrated this party and managed to steal the heart of Skell. They were then able to resurrect Skell, and Skell then confronted the Dark Lord again. This time, Skell was victorious, and to assure his victory and prevent the Dark Lord from ever returning again, Skell ordered his followers to cut Lao up into pieces and get rid of him. Skell's followers did that and got the bright idea to cast his remains into the lake for the lake creatures to eat. However, many of the lake creatures were followers of Lao, so they told them they were feeding them the remains of Skell. The lake creatures gladly feasted on the remains until Skell's followers put Lao's head into the lake. Now horrified at this, the lake creatures stopped feasting on the remains, and the remaining head is said to be what we call Wizard Island today. A takeaway from this story is that Wizard Island is the place on the lake where many weird things are said to happen. Another interesting thing is we see a reference to the gods' abilities to shapeshift into different animals, and one must wonder if this could explain some of the more bizarre creatures that have reportedly been seen here, or if it was just Kalamath's explanation of some things they had seen around Crater Lake. For 7,500 years, the lake remained a sacred place, a place not known to the outside world. But that all changed in the 1850s and the 1860s when Crater Lake was discovered and rediscovered about four times by the European settlers. 
By 1868, the lake received a new name, no longer called a sacred place, but now referred to as Crater Lake. And by 1902, the lake was no longer in Klamath territory, but was now the property of the United States government, which decided to turn this majestic lake into a national park. An interesting thing to note, though, is how the European settlers viewed Crater Lake versus the Native Americans. The European settlers were in awe of Crater Lake and reported that the natives were scared and stayed away. An Oregon newspaper once published the following, There is probably no point of interest in America that has completely overcome the ordinary native with fear as Crater Lake. From time immemorial, no power has been strong enough to induce them to approach within sight of it. For a paltry sum, they will engage to guide you thither, but before reaching the mountain, will leave you to proceed alone. To the savage mind, it is clothed with a deep veil of mystery and is the abode of all manner of demons and unshapely monsters. Many settlers said that the local natives would outright deny the lake's existence. When they admitted if it existed, they claimed only medicine men and those with mental fortitude should ever visit. Now, a Klamath tribal elder named Selden Kirk said that the stories of his people being afraid are overblown. He says his people stayed away because there was nothing practical there. There was no fish. There were hostile tribes nearby. So he said that the warning to stay away had a more practical reason than a supernatural one. This could very well be true. It could also be true that when the natives found out that the European settlers had discovered Crater Lake, they came up with a tall tale to try and scare them away from their own sacred lake. However, that may not be the case. From what we've researched, the evidence clearly points to the fact that there was a genuine fear of Crater Lake at some point. Take the following accounts from different groups that interacted with the Klamath. This particular account was written in 1896. Around the lake, innumerable pinnacles and beetling crags of black, crimson, and yellow bristled to the sky in a vast amphitheater. Yonder arching caverns pierced the base of a fearful precipice, whose frowning walls glowered upon the rugged rock island of the Phantom Ship, a fantastic object of unspeakable dread to the Klamath natives. This next account was written around the same time. The natives long believed that the only punishment could come to men who looked upon a lake that was sacred to the spirits. Do not look upon this place. The legend warned, for it will mean death or lasting sorrow. And finally, let's take a look at this last account that took place during the Hillman's expedition. They encountered a band of natives whom they questioned about it. None would acknowledge such a lake existed. One member of the group reported that we learned from a medicine man that this place was looked upon as sacred and death came to only natives who gazed upon the lake. These accounts alone show that at the time there was a genuine fear and possibly a good reason to be scared. Located in Washington County near West Fork, Arkansas, the Devil's Den State Park is a 2,500 acre state park with a variety of activities. The Civilian Conservation Corps began work on the park in 1933 and completed it fully in 1937. Devil's Den State Park is located in the Lee Creek Valley of the Boston Mountains, which, again, are located in the southwestern part of the Ozarks and are home to the Boston Mountain Zoo. In fact, it is open year-round for recreation and includes trails for hiking, mountain biking, horseback riding, as well as an eight-acre lake built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Along with several picnic areas, a swimming pool, and cabins, the Devil's Den State Park offers a variety of camping options ranging from modern to rustic. At Devil's Den State Park, all sorts of fossils can be found along the banks of Lee Creek and within the creek itself. In 1946, a family that was vacationing at Devil's Den State Park when their eight-year-old daughter went missing suddenly. The girl was gone, seemingly disappeared for six days until she was finally found in a cave about 30 miles away from where she vanished. When searchers had actually found the little girl, they were completely taken aback by her calm and unfazed demeanor. She even walked out of the cave, announcing to the people, here I am. When she was looked over, there were no signs of harm on the little girl, even though she was clad in nothing but a bathing suit and somehow miraculously traveled 30 miles in a nearly week-long period. Many have asked the question, how? Did she somehow disappear and end up so far away? It doesn't make sense. Some have theorized that she had been chased, causing her to run away from where her family was camped. Some have suggested a creature like Bigfoot may have been to blame for this, but it cannot be proved. 
No matter what the reasoning was, there was something strange happening in Devil's Lake Den during that time. The Battle of Gettysburg was a battle during the American Civil War that took place on July 1st through the 3rd, 1863, and became known as the bloodiest battle in American history. Over those three brutal days, two great armies battled over the future of the United States, resulting in over 50,000 killed, wounded, and missing. In fact, the battle was so great that scars from Clash are still visible to visitors today. With all the pain and suffering, it is no wonder that Gettysburg National Military Park is constantly one of the most haunted places in the world. With hundreds of reported paranormal sightings and experiences being reported annually, as a matter of fact, these sightings have been anything from people believing to be watching reenactors, with one soldier even coming to hand off cartridges only to simply vanish. Later. The cartridges were examined and soon proved to be actual Civil War issued cartridges from 1863. Yet another story involves a shoeless being that has been known to approach travelers and provide them with useful information about what they need and where they need to go. It is believed that this ghost is the spirit of a Confederate Texas soldier who had died during the Civil War. He has been photographed as far back as the 1970s. Even in shots that did not identify him at the time, the pictures were taken. One narrative tells of a woman who became disoriented while navigating the rugged terrain of a battle site right near Little Round Top and had to call for help. She looked about frantically for a way out of the area and when a man appeared out of nowhere, he pointed to a far location and stated, what you're looking for is over there. Then he had vanished without a trace. The woman later informed park authorities of what had occurred and, when they inquired as to the man's appearance, she simply gave a very accurate description of what a Confederate Texas soldier would have looked like at the time. There have also been claims of a poltergeist known as the Ghost Rider roaming the same battlefield which has been linked to the conflict himself. He will supposedly emerge out of nowhere accompanied by the sounds of gunfire and yelling and then leave as fast as he had appeared leaving no trace of his whereabouts or identity behind. While the Jenny Wade house is also often referred to as America's most haunted house, it was actually where one of the lone civilian casualties occurred during the Battle of Gettysburg. Jenny Wade, who was a resident of the dwelling, was struck by a stray bullet while she was standing in her kitchen baking, supposedly. Wade, who died on the first day of the fight, is supposed to be roaming the house with several children. Now. According to legend, when on the second level of the house, visitors may or may not hear loud bangs and the innocent voice of a little child, as well as experiencing sudden rushes of cold air in their faces. Others have even described the feeling of arms of the small children grasping their legs as they walked. The Saks Cover Bridge, which is a beautiful reminder of a bygone era in Pennsylvania, may well be one of the most haunted locations in all of Gettysburg. Now, according to local legend, the bridge, which was crossed by the fleeing Confederate army, is also believed to have been the location of the public hanging of three army deserters. Those who have also visited the bridge have told stories of seeing apparitions and smelling cigar smoke, hearing voices, and feeling a touch when no one else is around them. In addition, it has also been reported that there are spirits that continue to inhabit the Gettysburg Hotel, which served as a hospital during the Civil War. Rachel who worked as a nurse during the horrific days of the Battle of Gettysburg, has been known to explore the rooms, rummage through guest drawers and luggage, and wheel carts around the lodge with reckless abandonment. The ghost of a Union soldier who died in the hospital is frequently seen wandering the halls of the hotel as well. Gettysburg College also acted as a field hospital for both sides all throughout the fight, giving the college a reputation for being haunted by ghosts for years on after. The most horrific of these tales actually might be traced back to the early 20th century. Uh, two college employees entered an elevator, pushed the button for the floor they desired, and then waited for the elevator to arrive. The elevator, on the other hand, had different plans and actually took them directly down below to the basement. When the elevator doors opened, these women were greeted by a horrific Civil War operating room where doctors worked to save the lives of injured and dying soldiers. And suddenly, 
The elevator began to move them up to a higher floor as a ghostly doctor approached them from the room. The two employees, who were escorted by a security guard, returned to the basement a few minutes later, only to discover there was nothing unusual. No one seems to be able to give a genuine explanation for all the strange things happening at Gettysburg, but it seems that the ghost of the Confederate and the Union Army may have never left the battlefield. The Grand Canyon National Park is one of the most well-known and visited state parks in the United States, if not the entire globe. This national park, located in northwestern Arizona, is the 15th location in the United States to be designated as one. It was established in 1872 in the Grand Canyon. A chasm formed by the Colorado River is the park's most prominent feature and is even sometimes referred to as one of the seven natural wonders of the modern world. It is the second most visited national park in the United States after the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, with more than a whopping 6 million recreational visitors every single year. The park and encompasses well over 1 million acres of unincorporated land in Mojave counties. This national park was announced as a World Heritage Site by United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organizations in 1979. The park is well known for its incredible and beautiful views as well as the mysteries and stories that surround it. The Hopi, one of the tribes that lived in the area at the time believed in a god named Masawu, which translates as Skeleton Man, was the spirit of death, earth god, a gatekeeper to the fifth world, and the keeper of fire in the ancient world. Now, besides that, he served as a master of the upper world, also known as the fourth world. He was present when decent people fled the evil of the third world in search of the promise of the fourth world. It is portrayed as wearing a dreadful mask, yet in another example of the Hopi's multiplicity of beliefs, Masawu was either described as a gorgeous bejeweled man beneath his mask or a bloodthirsty, fearsome creature beneath the mask. He is also endowed with a number of benevolent characteristics. And according to one legend, it was Masawu who assisted the Hopi in settling Oribe and granting them stewardship over the area. He had also warned them to be on the lookout for the arrival of the Pahana, also known as the Lost White Brother. Legend has it that the Masa lived in the canyon and he is the reason for many reports of mysterious lights coming up from the canyon during the night or even the sounds of knocking on rocks. It is said that if you see or hear these events, the keeper of death is coming for you. Many see this as a nonsensical or ancient tribe, but others have reported the feeling of nausea and anxiety soon after witnessing these same events. The specific area that Massa is said to be located is in a relatively level area of the park, yet many accidents have occurred there. The great state of Washington is home to the Olympic National Park, a national park of the United States dedicated to conservation and recreation. The park is divided into four geographical regions, the Pacific coastline, the alpine areas, temperate and rainforest on the west side, and the forest on the drier east side. There are three distinct ecosystems within the park, including a subalpine forest and a wildflower meadow a temperate forest and the rugged Pacific coast. Mount Olympus National Monument was established by President Theodore Roosevelt on March 2nd, 1909, and is in fact the oldest national monument in the United States. Now, it was on June 29th, 1938, that Congress and President Franklin D. Roosevelt officially redesignated the monument as a national park. The Olympic National Park designated as an international biosphere reserve by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in 1976, and as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1981. As part of the Olympic Wilderness designation in 1988, Congress had designated 95% of the park, which equates to around 1,300 square miles. The Olympic Wilderness was renamed the Daniel J. Evans Wilderness in 2017 in honor of former governor and U.S. Senator Daniel J. Evans. When he was a member of the Senate, Evans was one of the sponsors of the 1988 bill that established the state's wilderness areas. It is the state's largest wilderness area by land area. In late January of 2018, the 100 of the forest trees were mysteriously and forcibly uprooted and knocked over. At the time, many professionals believed it was due to a powerful windstorm or weather-related incident, but no weather statistics showed anything that powerful had happened during this time frame. And to add to the mystery, the night right before, 
Many visitors to the area had claimed to hear loud rumblings echoing through the forest. With this information, it was then theorized that perhaps an earthquake or a landslide had occurred, though no evidence surfaced to back it up. It was reported that some trees had been completely uprooted and thrown on their sides, while other trees were only tipped, leaning, and some broken. To this day, there has been no exact reason found for the cause of these trees to have fallen though there have been some ideas. Some believe it may have been a large creature or herd of creatures. While some believe it may have been the work of extraterrestrials or their spacecraft, the mystery ultimately remains unsolved. The Yosemite National Park is located in California and is bordered on the southeast by the Sierra National Forest and the Northwest. The park, which is managed by the National Park Service, spans almost 760,000 acres and is located in four counties. It is known for its beautiful granite cliffs, waterfalls, clear streams, huge sequoia groves, lakes, mountains, meadows, glaciers, and ecological richness. Almost the entirety of the park is just a vast wilderness and Yosemite is one of the Sierra Nevada's largest and least fragmented habitat blocks, supporting a massive diverse range of plants and animals. In fact, approximately half of California's 7,000 plant species are found in the Sierra Nevadas. It was here in this majestic area of the United States that on the evening of September 19th, 2002, a disc-like unidentified flying object was reportedly seen in the sky. There were numerous reports taken of the event, with some onlookers even getting video footage of this UFO. It was only a short time later that the object disappeared and that the United States Air Force aircraft was seen in the area. Though they circled the area where the UFO had been reported multiple times, the pilots were unable to find what so many people had seen and gotten video of. Some of these videos taken are views of some of the best UFO footage ever taken. This event in September of 2002 is one of the many that have been reported in Yosemite. Many park goers have claimed to have witnessed a strange light hovering and flying throughout the night skies. Many experts have dismissed the idea of extraterrestrials and UFOs, saying that what people are seeing is most likely optical illusions or even meteors streaking through the night. To date, many believe these events have never been properly investigated, leading many to cling on to the idea of aliens visiting Yosemite. Death Valley National Park is located east of the Sierra Nevadas and connects the California-Nevada boundary. The park protects part of the Mojave Desert and its diversified environment of salt flats, sand dunes, badlands, valley canyons, and mountains which lie on the border between the arid Great Basin and the Mojave deserts. The park is the largest in the southern United States, as well as the hottest, driest, and lowest park in the country. Badwater Basin is the second lowest point in the Western Hemisphere and the lowest in North America. A designated wilderness area covers more than 93% of the park in total. From as early as 7000 BC, a number of Native American tribes have lived in the area, the most recent being the Timbisha, who have traveled between winter camps in the valleys and summer grounds in the highlands around 1000 AD. Even though just one person died there, a group of European Americans stranded in the valley in 1849 while hunting for a shortcut to California's gold fields gave the valley its name. Due to the vast and barren area, Death Valley is a known spot for people losing their way and going missing. One very hot day, nearly 120 degrees Fahrenheit in July of 1996, four tourists from Germany went missing in Death Valley. The last place they were known to be was a small ghost town where they both signed a visitor's book. They wrote, we are going through the pass. Authorities assumed that the foreigners meant the Mengel Pass when the tourists missed their flight home. German authorities had been alerted. And on August 14th, the Germans were officially reported missing. The van that they had rented was found abandoned on October 23rd with three flat tires. Nothing of note was found in the vehicle, no wallets, no passports, nothing of any real significance. This led many who were following the story to believe that the Germans had possibly been kidnapped. And nothing of note happened in the investigation for well over 20 years until 2009 where human skeletal remains were found in Death Valley. Though the remains were never officially identified, local authorities on the case claim that they were fairly certain that the bones were that of the Germans that had gone missing in 1996. 2009 was the last update to the case and it is still a mystery that has not been officially solved. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is a national park located in Tennessee and North Carolina in the southeast United States. This park encompasses the Great Smoky Mountain Ridgeline, which is a part of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which are part of the broader Appalachian Mountains. The park's 
core is divided by the border between the two states, which runs northeast to southwest. On its way from Georgia to Maine, the Appalachian Trail passes through the park's heart. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in the United States, nearly capping out at 14 million people every single year. And with over half a million acres, is anyone surprised? The park also protects a number of historical structures that once belonged to communities of the early European American settlers in the area. The park was established by the United States Congress in 1934 and President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He dedicated it in the 1940s. This was also the first national park to receive federal funding for land and other costs, while other parks were entirely funded by the state or private donations. This national park is the focal point of a thriving tourism sector in this section of Tennessee which borders the park. The park is unfortunately known for many disappearances all throughout its existence, and one of the more notorious was the case of Dennis Martin. In 1969, a then six-year-old Dennis and his family were on a hiking trip in the Smoky Mountains, and Dennis, along with his three brothers, planned to spook their parents by hiding and then jumping out as they walked by. While Dennis went on one way to hide and his brothers went another as the parents walked past, becoming victims of their kid's prank, only the three brothers emerged. Dennis was nowhere to be found. The family then began to frantically search for the boy, calling Dennis's name, but to no avail. And soon, an entire search party was called in to help in finding the boy. Dennis was never found. Many speculate that he was kidnapped or even dragged off by a wild animal, but there's been no proof to establish these assumptions. Dennis had vanished without leaving a single trace of what had happened to him, even today. Nobody knows what happened to poor Dennis Martin over 50 years ago. Though he is presumed dead by most authorities, sadly, this case of missing persons is only one of several to take place in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The first strange thing that really stood out to me is the tree that is known as the Old Man. This is probably the best documented thing that can suggest that. Just maybe, there is something truly strange going on in Crater Lake. The Old Man is a 30-foot hemlock tree that floats upright in Crater Lake with about three feet showing above the surface. Carbon dating estimates the tree to be over 450 years old and it was first sighted in 1896 by a geologist, Joseph Diller. Many things about this tree are strange and odd to say the least. The first fact is that the tree looks like it is rooted into the lake bed below. However, it moves across the lake. In 1938, a group was commissioned to see just how far this tree moves. It was determined that from the month of July to the month of October that this tree had moved around the lake some 62.7 miles. In fact, on August 6th, it was recorded as moving a whopping 3.8 miles. Some people have argued that the wind is blowing the tree around the lake. It has been observed that the old man often goes in the direction against the wind. Another thing that has stumped scientists is the fact that this tree has been floating for so long. I couldn't find a definitive answer on how long the process usually takes, but normally what happens is that a tree floating in a body of water will become waterlogged and ultimately will sink over time. The process is usually a lot quicker than 120 years, and for all we know, the old man could have been in the lake longer than that. And yet, another strange thing about the old man is the way it is floating. It is floating in an upright position. Scientists have measured the tree, and according to their calculations, a tree the size of the old man should be floating horizontal, not vertical. This has caused scientists to try and develop a hypothesis to explain the abnormal behavior. One theory is that the rocks were attached to the tree's roots when it fell into the lake and thus has caused the tree to anchor into an upright position. However, there's no evidence to suggest that this is the case. Because scientists don't have a definitive answer on why the old man floats the way it does, some have begun to suggest that the old man defies known physics. Its origins and floating orientation is not the only weird thing associated with the old man. Some people claim that it has the power to alter the very weather around it. The story has been told hundreds of times and goes like this. In the year 1988, a group of scientists was going to conduct a submarine expedition of the lake itself. They viewed the old man as a safety hazard and decided it would be best to moor it in on the eastern shore of Wizard Island. The story goes that the crew had not so much as put the rope around the log when out of nowhere, the sky turned dark and the lake waters suddenly became violent and a nasty storm began to rage. The crew began to panic and untied the tree. 
The crazy thing is that as soon as the rope was removed, the skies immediately cleared. The wind stopped and the weather returned to the blissfulness that existed before they had put the rope onto the old man. An interesting note is that, as mentioned earlier in the video, Wizard Island is associated with the Dark Lord Lao. So maybe something is truly going on, whether there be a dark energy trapped on it or something unexplainable, perhaps something supernatural. I tried to see if there was anything conclusive that would point to this really happening, but I couldn't find any firsthand accounts of this. However, I did find that indeed a submarine expedition did take place in 1988 and that several park rangers at Crater Lake believe this to be a true story. So much so that they no longer allow people to jump onto the old man and pose for pictures. If reports are believed to be true, then Crater Lake is also home to none other than Sasquatch himself. As unfortunate as it is in today's world, you have to be skeptical of anybody who claims to have seen this hairy beast walking around. Ever since the infamous video shot by Roger Patterson in 1967, sightings of the cryptid have been reported everywhere across North America and then some. Scientists are quick to dismiss the idea as being a misidentified bear or other strange natural occurring animal, while the good old rational thinking skeptics say it's a person in a suit. Apparently, people dressing up in a Bigfoot suit really happens, and in fact, the show 1000 Ways to Die tells a story about a person dressed in a Sasquatch suit that went completely wrong. The show identifies the man as Luke Wiggins, which is probably not his real name because the show claims to change the names of the deceased individuals. Anyway, Wiggins lived near a park and he got tired of seeing the runners on the trails around his property. So one day, he got the bright idea to dress as a Sasquatch and terrorize the runners. This went on for a bit. However, it wasn't long before the park rangers began to hear the stories about Sasquatch roaming the park and one ranger went out with a dart gun and he came across a Sasquatch in the act of terrorizing an innocent jogger. The park ranger opened the fire, hit the hairy beast, only to discover that it wasn't a Sasquatch, but a man in a Sasquatch suit that his tranquilizer dart had killed. And yet another story about a Bigfoot impersonator gone wrong involves Randy Lee Tenley. In 2012, Randy decided to put on a ghillie suit and stalk a remote Montana highway. Only, it didn't go too well for him as he was hit by a car and then subsequently ran over by another one. Randy's friends said that he was trying to trick people into thinking that they saw a Sasquatch. It's stories like these that caused the general public to dismiss the reports of Sasquatch often and with his prevalence in pop culture, it makes a supposed sighting harder to take seriously. However, there are thousands of people who claim to have come across this hairy cryptid and they are diehard believers. So the million dollar question, is there any evidence for the existence of Sasquatch? You could probably sit around all day and argue about that. So, but that my friends is a rabbit hole for a whole other video. Many native tribes in the Western United States have strange stories about tall, hairy wild men. For example, on the Thule Indian Reservation, there's a pictograph that supposedly shows a giant hairy biped and is estimated to be over 1000 years old. And not only are there these strange carvings and pictographs, but there are numerous stories from the days of old that tend to support the idea that Sasquatch is genuine. Take for example, the story of Rachel Plummer. She was captured in 1836 by a Comanche raiding party. And for the next two years, she was taken across the prairie. She was finally freed. And when she returned, she wrote about an account about her exploits. She described the various animal and plant life on the prairie, However, she mentions a curious animal that in English is described as and translated as man tiger. This creature had been encountered on multiple occasions in the mountains by the Comanche. It was said to have the shape of a man, but to be very hairy and have a height of almost nine feet tall. Then there is William Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill. He claims that a group of Pawnee Indians showed him a giant thigh bone. They claimed that this bone belonged to a race of human-like giants. However, they no longer existed as they were wiped out by a flood eons ago. Two other great frontiersmen tell stories that can be associated with Sasquatch. Daniel Boone claimed that he had killed a 10-foot giant that he referred to as a Yahoo. In his book, The Wilderness Hunter, President Theodore Roosevelt wrote about an encounter he had with an old mountain hunter named Bowman. The story goes that he was out and about and encountered Bowman. Bowman then stopped Roosevelt and asked him whether he had heard about his story about his encounter with a great beast. 
Roosevelt replied no, and Bowman proceeded to tell him a story about how him and his partner were looking for beaver. They came into a cave only to be attacked by a tall, hairy beast. Bowman's partner was injured and Bowman fled, leaving his partner there to die. Moving back to Oregon, a famous encounter with Sasquatch supposedly happened in 1924. Five gold prospectors were seeking out gold near Mount St. Helens. One of the prospectors had a meeting with a giant hairy creature. The prospector, named Fred Beck, claimed he shot the beast. And that night, as Beck and the other four miners were sleeping in their cabin, an all-out assault on the cabin began. The creature returned, but this time with friends and family, and they began hurling boulders and rocks towards the miners. Beck was knocked out by a boulder that was tossed through the roof, and these creatures tried to break down the door. They continued their assault until daybreak, and once daybreak finally did hit, these creatures retreated back into the forest from where they had came. The Forest Service dispatched several rangers into the area, but found no evidence of such creatures existing. These stories sound fantastic and can be hard to believe. In fact, many people probably consider these stories nothing but fictitious and tall tales. However, I tend to think they might have some credibility to them. Now, returning to Crater Lake, our favorite native tribe, the Klamath Indians, have ancient stories involving a giant creature. In fact, the show Finding Bigfoot did visit the Klamath and did an episode about the entire area. The video does a pretty good job explaining some of the Klamath's beliefs about this creature. Ironically, the show didn't find Bigfoot. Instead, they did find something else. And that brings us to the next stage of strange things occurring in Crater Lake. And those are strange lights and phantom campfires. The show Fighting Bigfoot was at Yamsay Mountain, which is around 35 miles east of Crater Lake. As they were out filming the show one night, some of the crew saw a strange light in the distance. At first, they thought it was a headlamp, but as they watched, they became convinced it was a ball of light or an orb of light floating through the forest. An interesting thing about this is that many of the native sacred places across the Americas are associated with strange lights. Take, for example, Brown Mountain in North Carolina, where these same orbs are often seen. The Native Americans view these lights as spirits. However, Native Americans are not the only ones who are seeing these lights. It is reported that people will see what appears to be campfires on many nights on Wizard Island. A park ranger tells the following story about her encounter with these ghostly campfires. One evening, she noticed these campfires and, and knew that it was an illegal camp set up on Wizard Island. So, she snuck onto the island and counted 10 illegal campers by the campfire. She radios for backup, she meets her backup, and they headed in to bust the illegal campers. However, when they arrived at the scene, there were no campers, no campfire, nor was there any evidence that there had even been one there. Along with the orbs of lights, the park is said to be frequently visited by UFOs and other strange paranormal phenomena. Witnesses claim that a lot of times, these lights will either ascend from out of the lake or descend into the lake. I find this to be interesting because if you have been paying attention to the reports that have been coming out from the Navy about their encounters with the UFOs or UAPS as they call them, they describe them doing the same thing. In fact, one famous sighting at Crater Lake occurred in 1997. Witnesses saw that they saw three discs racing across the lake. And later that day, they heard a loud sonic boom that was so powerful it caused their car alarms to go off. Supernatural beings, supernatural trees, giant cryptids, and space aliens are not the only weird things about Crater Lake. In fact, the park has had some tales of some pretty strange deaths and disappearances, which still go on to this day. In fact, one of them is described as spontaneous suicide. Before getting into this encounter, I want to return to the very first mythology surrounding the lake. If you remember, when telling the mythology of the lake and how the native people feared the lake, they said only medicine men and people with strong mental fortitude should ever visit. The reason for that is they claim that the lake has the power to mesmerize you. If one stares too long, a person will enter a trance-like state leading to death. Could this be what has happened to so many unfortunate souls? The first creepy and horrifying story about this occurred in 1947 and is described as spontaneous suicide. A park visitor by the name of Mr. Cornelius was visiting the park and suddenly, as if in a trance-like state, he hands his wife his wallet and keys and headed for the lake. He attempted to jump into the lake, but slid to the water's edge, breaking his ankle in the process. However, he got up and was determined he was going into the lake. 
he hobbled out to the lake where he disappeared underneath the water and unfortunately drowned. To this day, nobody knows why this happened or what caused him to do what he did. Another strange story occurred in 1944 and involved two U.S. military planes that were flying in formation over the lake. When the pilot of one of the planes looked over, he was in shock. His partner's plane was nowhere to be found. His partner's plane had simply vanished. What makes it even more strange is there was no distress call, no sign of any trouble whatsoever. Recovery attempts determined that the aircraft had crashed into the lake, but there were no clear indications of how or why this had happened. And probably the most creepy story occurred in 1974, when a nature photographer named Charles McCuller was visiting the park the only thing was he would never leave the park. The official account of Charles goes like this. He was an aspiring nature photographer from Virginia. He was taking a cross-country photography trip and had ended up in Oregon near Crater Lake. He was staying at a friend's house and in January, he departed for Crater Lake and told his friend, if I'm not back here by February 1st, you need to report me missing. His friend took note and it was odd because he didn't appear to be well equipped to face the winter conditions at Crater Lake at the time. However, he didn't think anything about it until February 1st, so an investigation went underway and the last known sighting occurred on January 30th. A park logger said he had given this photographer a lift to the entrance of Crater Lake Park. He said that his van was unable to drive in the heavy snow. What happened next is anybody's guess. Two years later, some hikers found a backpack lying in a remote canyon. They turned it in and it was identified as belonging to him. A search of the area found a body, but it was in the most peculiar state. The body was located about 12 miles from his last thought camping location. What is even more strange about the location is the area is covered in deep snow during the months of January. In fact, there is so much snow that skiers and snowmobilers have a hard time navigating through the area. However, it appeared that McCuller hiked his way to this location and what is even more bizarre is that he seemed only partially dressed. Even stranger was the condition of his remains. Only a few bones had remained. The authorities at the time are quoted as saying that it looked like he just melted away. Officially, his cause of death is labeled as an accident. However, others think that there might be more to it than that. Maybe he was the victim of foul play or encountered one of the many strange phenomena reported at Crater Lake. I do not believe that all this strangeness can be chalked up to people's imaginations and tall tales. In fact, I think that whatever is going on in Crater Lake has been going on for a long time now, and that the Kalamath tribe encountered this strangeness, and thus the inspiration for their colorful mythological stories about Crater Lake had formed. But I would love to know what you guys think. Is Crater Lake truly a supernatural hotspot with possibly having portals to another dimension? Or is it all just a bunch of hoaxes, tall tales, and fabrications? On February 14th, 2022, a 64-year-old Gail Stewart went mysteriously missing. She had simply gone for a walk near her home in Reno, Nevada, and was later on reported missing when she did not return to her home. After the authorities were contacted by family and friends, a search then ensued. Authorities, friends, and family searched the entire area of the Coughlin Ranch, Alum Creek, and Truckee River in hopes of finding some trace that Gail Stewart was ever here, but to no avail, they did not. After the group had spread out more beyond the original grid of the search, one of the members in one of these search groups had happened to peer over a nearby cliff and there was Stewart, just dangling there, gripping onto a tree. Fortunately for her, she was rescued but by the time that they had got to her, she was already unresponsive and showing signs of hypothermia. She was also missing one shoe, and friends, family, and search rescue personnel were unsure of whatever adventure she had gone on. It must have been a wild one because she only had one shoe and they weren't exactly sure what happened to the other shoe. Authorities, friends and family, and search personnel are all baffled how she became in this situation in the first place and that she had seemingly sustained injuries on her knees, legs, and feet. Fortunately, after being taken to a hospital and her injuries treated and looked over, she was released, happy to be alive, and ready to go home to see her friends and family. Now, call it a coincidence or call it fate, but the same woman, Gail Stewart, 64 years old, went missing yet again a month to the date on March 14th, 2022, to go take pictures at the Hoover Dam, over 400 miles away from her home in Reno, Nevada. She had simply just wanted to take some snapshots and photography of nature and the scenery around her because the Hoover Dam recreation area is very beautiful and breathtaking. 
In fact, it's so much so that it is a very popular tourist attraction, garnering almost 7.5 million visitors going through the same park every year. And a park of this size, sitting on over 150 million acres, it would make searching almost impossible. What's strange about Stewart's case is after she was alerted by the authorities and park ranger personnel that she had been missing, they began searching the area for her and had found her vehicle still left in the parking lot with her cell phone and her purse left behind, which was very strange to begin with. Could she have possibly wandered off through the recreation area and then something happened to her? Did she fall and slip? Did she go through a time anomaly? Was she taken? How is it that this woman just mysteriously vanished without a trace, leaving no signs whatsoever? Recently, Stewart's own son, Matthew, posted on his Facebook page saying, Mom, wherever you are, I hope you're not in pain and I hope you found peace. Clearly distraught and traumatized from his own mother's disappearance. A family in heartache without any answers or conclusions as to what has happened to their loved ones. This same kind of situation is happening all the time with missing persons in cases around national parks all over the country, and it's not getting any better, folks. People are just disappearing without a trace, leaving nothing behind. Is it possible that Gail Stewart was just yet another one of them? Or was she taken, kidnapped, or did something more nefarious happen to her? This next one details the accounts of a 10-year-old boy who encountered something very strange, possibly a fae or fairy as they know. Written in the American Ethnology Report of 1898, the story details of a 10-year-old boy who had gone missing but was later found again even though his circumstances were very strange and fortunately was not injured or hurt. At the time of his disappearance, a young boy by the name of Wofford, after practicing some archery for a while, he had the thought, hey, I could do some fishing around here and bring home a couple of good fish for my mom to cook for supper. And getting excited, he runs down to the river and he begins setting up stones in an attempt to try and trap some fish at the time when out of nowhere, this mysterious, kind, gentle stranger comes out of the woods and starts talking to the boy saying, oh, you look tired, you look hungry, are you okay? Do you need any help? Even though Wofford was put off by this stranger coming out of nowhere, his demeanor, his character, his body language was everything calm and persuasive, very gentle. And this is when he offered the boy to come back to his house to have wonderful amounts of food and dinner and dessert and laughing and fun. And being 10 years old, you're a lot more naive. So the boy just said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And even though the presence of this person just coming out of nowhere was strange, the boy wasn't too off put just by how gentle and calm this stranger appeared to be. So the boy and this mysterious stranger decided to take a small walk in the woods where they had arrived at this beautiful house. Wofford would later talk about the house and the condition that it was in. It was beautiful, very well kept, very brightly lit. It wasn't creepy or eerie at all feeling. In fact, it was so welcoming and warming that as soon as Wofford stepped in the house, any tenseness, nervousness, or apprehension he had immediately dissolved away. And as soon as he entered the house, he could smell the aroma of delicious food, desserts. There were people laughing and chuckling and singing. It was a wonderful place to be. And so Wofford sat down ate his fill and food, delicious food, mind you, had some great dessert, and he began too joining in with everybody else, laughing and playing. And during this time, while he was enjoying social hour, he noticed one of his neighbors who was also there with him, which just solidified to him, okay, well, if he's here, then I'm definitely safe and I could really let my guard down. Now, after a while of playing and having fun, he eventually grew tired and fell asleep for the night. After he had awoke in the morning, he had told the strange man who had led him to the house in the first place, I gotta get home. I'm sure my family's worried sick about me. They're probably panicking. And so the man smiled at him and led him out the house along a small dirt path. To the left was a cornfield and on the right side was an apple orchard. Again, I wanna emphasize just how beautiful and serene the house and the surrounding property was. It was like a little piece of fantasy land in the deep woods. And so this man is talking to this boy, leading him towards the end of the path, and he points off in the direction at the end of this path saying, if you go over this hill, which was a ridge and a river, then you'll end up back at your house. And so as the boy looked and went to turn around to say goodbye to the stranger one last time, he had somehow vanished. And here's where it gets even more crazy, because not only did this mysterious kind stranger vanish, but the scenery around him changed. 
No more was this stunning, beautiful apple orchard even existing, and no more was this cornfield there. Everything around him was deep, dense wilderness. In fact, the path they even walked on was now no longer there. And so now the boys kind of freaking out thinking, what just happened? Where am I? And was fortunate enough to find his way back where he had heard people screaming his name. And turns out it was his friends and family who had been looking for him since the evening prior. When they had found him, they were more than happy to embrace him and love on their son and ask, what happened? Where have you been? And he very calmly explained, I had met this stranger in the woods. He took me to this house. I had delicious food and dessert. Oh, and my neighbor was there. And the same neighbor that was supposedly there at the house was one of the members searching for him along with the family. Now, this neighbor was looking at this kid as Wofford is explaining, yeah, I, I saw you there at the dinner party last night. You were enjoying yourself and laughing. And the neighbor looks at him strangely saying, no, I've been spending my past evening and morning looking for you. Where have you been? Wofford's tale is simply unexplainable, but many on the superstitious side or the paranormal side like to believe that this was a perfect example of the fae or fairy people. But of course, that is just speculation, while others believe that this was simply the case of a nanahi or a shapeshifter of some kind. But usually they're always synonymous with darkness and danger and evil. So for it to show kindness, and for what reason? And if that truly was the case, then why did it or he take him back to his house, feed him, give him food, give him comfort, and then just allow him to leave? It didn't really make sense. So if you're looking at it from a paranormal perspective, it could very well possibly be the Fae. Or if you want to look at it critically and see a real world example, he could just very well be making it up. But if he was making it up, then how do we explain where he had gone the entire night and day? Why would he go so far as to try and lie about his neighbor being somewhere that he didn't? The boys seemed very honest and adamant that this happened. If we were to look at this critically, how could we write this off as logically happening? While the story does present itself as extremely interesting, it's hard to really know what exactly this could have been. This next story comes from an anonymous submitter who had claimed that they had saw a man they're not sure if it's a ghost or an apparition or a real person or what, come running out of the woods onto the road, clutching their bloodied shoulder and chest to only vanish. In the email, the man referred to himself as Jonathan and was claiming that one evening, him and his wife were going into Yosemite National Park. Now, he didn't exactly explain where in the park they were, but that it was evening time and the sun was setting pretty low into the sky to where it wasn't exactly pitch dark yet, but visibility was much lower than normal. And for when it sounds like in the emails that Jonathan and his wife were trying to look for the camping spot in which they had previously booked and that they were going to be staying at for at least four or five days. And as they're driving through the area, they come across a section where it's just trees on both sides of the road, which in any national park during camping areas is very common. And as this road is curving, they see a man in what looks like black slacks and a blue button up shirt running out onto the road directly in front of their car, clutching his left shoulder with blood all around. The man looked completely in panic and terrified, but it all happened so quickly that when the man ran out in front of Jonathan's car, Jonathan was forced to slam on the brakes and go right through him, or so he described. He immediately stopped the car, put it in park because he had thought he had just ran over Jonathan. He jumps out of the car with his phone using it as a light, but doesn't see anything. In fact, there was nobody there. Completely frightened and confused and puzzled by this, he runs back in the car asking his wife, did, did you see what I just saw? And she's just as equally frightened as Jonathan, saying, yeah, I did. Did we hit him? Like, what happened? But there seemed to be no trace of the mysterious man running out in front of the car. Jonathan was very disturbed by this sighting. And in fact, he went on to detail how him, nor his family, nor his wife have any past history of hallucinating, taking any mind-altering substances, or smoking weed, or drinking alcohol. In fact, this sighting was so vivid, he can recall exactly what the man looked like. He had short black curly hair, a clean shaven face, a rather larger nose, and he seemed pale and covered in sweat. And he was convinced that this man was running from something or someone, and that he even remembered how hard the man was gripping his chest and thought he had either been shot or attacked and was seeking help. But as soon as this man ran out in front of Jonathan's car, he turned to meet Jonathan's headlights going right through him and he managed to disappear. So Jonathan wonders, 
Was this some apparition or possibly a dead person that was showing itself, possibly reliving its past over and over? Or was this just a random hallucination that somehow both him and his wife saw? Whatever the case is, it is surely disturbing to say the least. If you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button and leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts and opinions. And as always guys, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that subscribe button and keep your notifications turned on as YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the next video.